My name is Jack Hood, and we are pleased tonight to have Mr. Steve Murray, who's the director of the Alabama Department of Archives and History. He's held that position from uh, 2012 to the present. Prior to that, he was assistant director for administration at the Alabama Depar Department of Archives and History. He did that from 2006 to 2012. Prior to that, he was a managing editor, editor of the Encyclopedia of Alabama from uh, 2002 to 2006. And prior to that, he was a managing editor of the Alabama Review, a quarterly journal of Alabama history, and he had done that from 2000 to 2006. He's originally from Louisiana. He went to Louisiana College, graduated there in 1993 with a double major in history and English. After that, he attended Auburn University and through their history department, got his master's degree, and his master's thesis was through the crucible of his own personality, Christian realism and the theology of Martin Luther King, Jr. Steve Murray is well qualified. He's been a friend of this end of court. He has done something special through the generosity of Barbara Shores, who's also here tonight. And we're proud to present for the first time the first public exposition of, uh, of what he's been working on to digitize the Arthur Shores papers. And that's what his talk will be about tonight. Please welcome Steve Murray. Thank you, Jack. It's a, really a privilege to be here with you this evening and to talk about some uh, topics that are near and dear to my heart and I think important to you too. And we're gonna, I'm going to approach it in a couple of different ways. Uh, I want to introduce you to some programming that's being developed on the occasion of Alabama's Bicentennial, which culminates next year in 2019. Anybody know what Alabama's official birth date is as a state? know this next year, year from now, <laughs> December 14th, 1819, Alabama became a state. And we have been commemorating that important anniversary over the span of three years. We started this in 2017 and we'll conclude it just about a year from now. Uh, we're doing some great things all over the state on the occasion of that anniversary. And I want to talk in particular about the importance of history education uh, as during this commemoration period and draw a direct connection, very direct connection from that effort to this organization and the wonderful uh, gift that came to the state of Alabama uh, through Jack's efforts and, and through some circumstances that arose at one of your previous meetings. And to tell you about a little bit about how we're using those resources uh, into the future. So to start, let me do a little bit of refresher on how this bicentennial business came about. This is actually a map of the uh, a map from 1817. Prior to that time, uh, what we know as Alabama today was part of the Mississippi Territory. And in March of 1817, the population around the Natchez re region over in west southwest Mississippi had grown enough uh, that Mississippi was ready to apply for statehood. So they petitioned Congress, got some legislation through that enabled them to hold a constitutional convention and write a state constitution. And they did that in December of 1817. At the same time, that Congress uh, passed the enabling legislation to allow Mississippi to proceed in that direction. They also directed that the eastern half of the Mississippi Territory would become the new territory of Alabama. So Alabama existed as a territory from March of 1817 up until we became a state in December of 1819. And that's, those are the bookends that we used in shaping the state's commemoration of its 200th birthday. It's from the time we became a territory in early 1817 up through statehood in 1819. The process, uh, you had to have a population of 60,000 people in a territory in order to apply uh, or to petition Congress to uh, write a constitution and became a state. That happened quickly because in those early years after uh, the defeat of the Creek Indians in 1814 and their signing of the Treaty of Fort Jackson in which they ceded 22 million acres of land in Alabama and Georgia, uh, 
uh, that opened a floodgate. What they called the Alabama fever was pulling people from the Carolinas and Georgia to come in and settle in all of this newly available land in the territory of Alabama. So our population was growing rapidly, and we crossed that threshold in the 1818 territorial census. In 1819, with uh, the help of Senator Charles Tate in Georgia, legislation passed through Congress enabling us to provide a constitution. That happened in the summer of 1819 in Huntsville. The Constitutional Convention met there in downtown Huntsville in July, the first couple of days of August they wrote uh, what was then one of the most progressive state constitutions in the country. Sent that off to Washington, D.C. to be reviewed and on December 14th Congress uh, passed a resolution accepting that constitution and President Monroe signed that resolution and so that's why our birthday is officially December 14th. So how do you celebrate, you know, getting to it? That's a significant milestone, 200 years. There's a lot of Alabama history leading up to that point. But how do we, how do we use that occasion to think about where we've come from as a people, who we are today, and where we want to go in the future? Those have been our goals in the state, which is a, and this is a broad collaboration of state agencies, private nonprofits, the Alabama Humanities Foundation here in Birmingham has been a key player in this effort. But together, we have said that that's, those are some of the things that we want to try to do. Look back in our past, think about how it's shaped who we are today, and use that understanding to help build a better Alabama in the future. Now, anytime that you've got, uh, and, and here's some of our ceremonies, anytime you've got an anniversary like this, you're going to have some pomp and circumstance and parties along the way. This is from uh, the kickoff of March of 2017. Uh, you know, Alabama, uh, kind of during the European phase of its history, started in Mobile, so we had a big kickoff down in Mobile last year. Uh, this has kind of been a trend of some parties, and, and there's good reason to do that. But we also wanted this to have some substance. So there's a whole series of projects that are taking place all over the state. If you can participate in and avail yourselves of. One of them is Making Alabama, a travel exhibit that's going to all 67 counties in the state. It's based loosely on the Museum of Alabama exhibit at our agency in, in Montgomery, but it's set up to uh, function in small spaces and public libraries, uh, local historical societies are hosting this all over the state. It has its own website, and I'll show you a URL a little bit later where you can find the schedule of where Making Alabama is going to be and when between now and the end of the bicentennial. And I encourage you to visit that. It's a great opportunity to take your kids and grandkids to see some terrific history, uh, beautifully presented, very interactive. A lot of it's digital on uh, these kiosks. That they've, they've really done a good job in succinctly providing a, a terrific overview of our past. Another important project that you may have seen on Alabama public television or heard on public radio already is the Alabama Legacy Moments. These are 200 short programs published or produced by APT that are <coughs> on some different chapter or episode in, in Alabama's history. You can visit that website and look at all of them. There's over 100 that have already been completed, and you can spend uh, you know, they're averaging 90 seconds to two minutes, so there's there's a good chunk of, chunk of time that you can already spend perusing through those, refining content related to your part of Alabama or a period of history that you're interested in. A project that I'm very excited about that relates to uh, Alabama's foundational documents uh, and the foundations of our law. We are using the occasion of the Bicentennial to have some important conservation work done on Alabama's six state constitutions and the 1861 Ordinance of Secession. Those seven documents help to define the state's relationship to the federal government. They also articulate the rights of its citizens and provide the basis of the work that you all do as attorneys uh, in shaping the way that the state's judiciary is going to work. Uh, this has been a, a really exciting project for us to, to see unfold. All seven of the documents have gone to one of the leading conservation centers in the country, uh, the Northeast Document Conservation Center, where they've undergone some really highly technical, highly skilled work 
to be sure that these documents are clean and in good shape and that they're going to be around 200 years from now. Because everything we do as an archives is thinking long term. How do we make sure that these records are going to be accessible to the public and still able to tell this fascinating story of Alabama history well into the future? And they were not in bad shape overall. Some of the work uh, has to do with actually uh, putting some binding agents on ink that is separating over time. There's a lot of iron in this ink uh, that wants to pull away from the paper. There's been a lot of dirt that's accumulated on these, uh, in some cases up to 200 years worth of it, a lot of uh, lamp soot and other things. And most of these have come back to us already, and we've just been amazed and really pleased at how great they look. Uh, these are going to be in an exhibit in Huntsville next July and the first half of August at the Huntsville Museum of Art. And then they'll be on display at State Archives next November and December of 2019. It's going to be a fantastic exhibit talking about the importance of what these documents do legally in terms of uh, creating the uh, Alabama system of government and some of the problems that have arisen over time because of, of, uh, of the way that uh, those that structure has been established. Something else that you'll want to look out for is the Alabama Passport. This is a terrific print project product that is available to you for ten dollars. You can buy this at uh, you find on the website where to get it locally, but it's at museums and uh, shops around the state. This is set up like a traditional travel passport, and that you can get it stamped in all sixty-seven counties. And we're going to be doing some fun things to recognize those folks who've been able to make it to all 67 counties and have their, their passport stamp. It's a great guide to local history all over the state, a uh, good way to orient your children and your grandkids to what some of those great places that make Alabama such a special place to live and, and to visit. There's also fantastic things that are being organized by local bicentennial committees across the state. And you can, visit, you can find an active committee in your community by visiting the Bicentennial website, learning about some of the really terrific things that are already happening. I mentioned this three-year commemoration period. One of the advantages of that is that it gives you plenty of time to get up a good head of steam and for local committees to be activated. And we've had terrific response from all over the state uh, with uh, people really getting engaged. Even the Girl Scouts have their own Bicentennial patch that they can earn. Uh, a lot of people really engaged in the spirit of this. This fall, a lot of uh, homecoming parades and other activities that have bicentennial themes. We expect to see more and more of that over the next uh, year. Some events that are coming up December 31st, New Year's Eve, will be in Mobile for the Moon Pie Drop. It's going to be a bicentennial Moon Pie Drop this year, so if you're down that part of the state, we invite you to be with us. We're going to kick off 2019 that way. And then next December, uh, 13th and 14th, Montgomery, Tuscaloosa, and Huntsville all have major events planned, and uh, you'll want to look out for those. Uh, some things happening here in Birmingham next summer are to be announced, and a lot of other special events happening in Huntsville next summer, because it's also another special anniversary. What else is happening in Huntsville in 2019? Think back just about 50 years ago. Some of you stayed up late to watch the moon landing. Huntsville is going to be commemorating Alabama's special role in the development of the space program, and uh, specifically the design and creation of the Saturn V rocket. So that's, they've got a, a especially significant summer next year with both of these anniversaries coming up. <coughs> so that's some of the, a lot of fantastic programming that's going on. But what I wanted to talk to you and, and really stress this evening is what I think is, is really the most significant and potentially most lasting outcome of the bicycle. And that is the concentration of resources through our agency in Montgomery and through partner organizations around the state to take a really hard look at how we're doing in history education in our classrooms. And the answer to that question is not terribly well. And that is the result of a lot of factors uh, some of it's related to federal policy, some of it's related to state level policy and the requirements that we have of the teachers before they walk into the classroom. Uh, but the general trend over the last 20 years has been to 
increasingly require standardized testing of our students. And what that does in the classroom is compel teachers to spend more and more time on the subjects in which their students are going to take those standardized exams. That's principally English and math. And what it's done as a consequence of that is more and more time is consumed on a daily basis in the classroom for those subjects. Other subjects that many of us were exposed to as young people have been pushed to the side. History and social studies being principal among those. We know from talking to teachers all over the state that they do not receive professional development opportunities in history and social studies, especially in the elementary years. They, uh, some of them teach maybe 15 minutes of social studies a day <coughs> for nine weeks, and then they'll switch over and teach science for a limited number of uh, minutes per day during the next part of the academic the consequence of that, and you see this, the evidence of this is clear in, in our online interactions, in our media, in the interactions that you see with young people, the result being that we are raising Alabamians and young Americans who do not know their history of their nation or of their state or of their community. They don't really understand their responsibilities as citizens. And they really know very little about the structure of government that exists in which all of us operate on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's creating a serious problem in the civic fabric of our state and of our country. This is something that we're trying to address in ways that we can through these bicentennial programs. <clears throat> and this is where we're going to circle back around to uh, advance shores in a court here just a second. For the past two years, with resources specially allocated for the Bicentennial, we have been hosting professional development institutes for elementary school teachers in 12 locations around the state. And we host 30 teachers in each one of these. And they, this is a, an intensive program. It's a four-day program. I think of it as Alabama History Boot Camp. And we expose teachers to new new ways of thinking about how to teach history in the classroom, the types of resources that are available to them in the classroom, <clears throat> and how they can think creatively about being sure that they've got some time that they can spend day to day on a day to day basis and exposing their students to history and the social studies. Uh, there's, there's kind of three principal things that we're finding that we've got to help them do. One of them is in content mastery. And the reason for that is that in the state of Alabama, we're not really out of the norm of the country as a whole now, but in the state of Alabama, you can go to any institution of higher learning, uh, with one exception, and get a college degree in elementary education, become a certified teacher, and walk into a classroom having taken only one college class in history. And that might be European history or world history or kind of anything that you might want to choose. We've looked at every course of study requirement in, in all the universities in Alabama. The only exception to that is Alabama A&M, and they require two. And then we ask those college graduates who had one history course to walk into the classroom and teach Alabama and United States history against a fairly rigorous course of study developed at the state level. And it's really no wonder that they don't feel well equipped to go in and do that on a day-to-day -day basis. So we try to provide opportunities where they are exposed to really leading experts in, in their fields. And each of these institutes has a different theme. They might, some of them are looking at civil war, some of them are looking at civil rights, some look at Native American history. But the idea is to expose them to the specialists. Frequently, these are college professors. It might be a historian or an archaeologist or a musicologist or a folklorist. The idea is to really let them dive deep into this for a few days and find out how fascinating and how special our history is as a state and how much their children, their students, deserve to know it. <coughs> the second thing that we work on is methodology. Getting away from worksheets 
and even textbooks, which can just be some of the deadliest, dull, you know, way of, of learning that you can find anywhere. There's so much that you can do in an interactive way through activities and games and, and, and uh, getting kids out of their seats and doing some active learning. We introduce them to some special ways to do that. And then thirdly, we help them to think about how to do this in an interdisciplinary way. What's a tortoise or a turtle doing at a history, a professional development session on history? Well, this one was taken down near Andalusia at our session, which was totally dedicated to the history of the longleaf pine and the importance of that species to all of Alabama history in shaping an economy and an ecosystem and the way that people lived and where they lived and how they made their living for a huge swath of our history and how central that was to the story of South Alabama. And now the process of trying to restore habitats so that the longleaf pine can make a comeback and the types of species that interact and live in those ecosystems where a longleaf pine can thrive. Isn't that an interesting history lesson? If you can absorb that and think about it in an interdisciplinary way and understand the science and the biology of it and also the centrality and the importance of that to Alabama history. That's what we're trying to do. Some of the tools that we're using to try to introduce these approaches include primary sources. Again, we want to get students' noses out of textbooks and often worksheets and put the raw materials of history in front of them. The letters and the diaries and the photographs and the maps that historians use to understand history can also be approached by a student. And they might need a little bit of coaching and some help from an educator in thinking about what kinds of questions to ask when they're looking at those primary sources. But they are uh, entirely capable of doing that and are going to have a much better experience as a result. We're also introducing them to historic sites and museums in their part of the state, many of which are in their own backyards, but they have no idea exist. And these are wonderful extensions of the classroom that teachers can use to expose their students to new uh, experiences and opportunities that are wonderfully enriching. And these were just some of the excursions that we took our teachers this summer to sites around the state. And then lastly are the classroom resources. And this is where we're still working. Uh, we, this, this project has given us a lot of new capacity. One of the ones that still exists are the needs for an electronic textbook on Alabama history, other types of digital resources that the teachers can use in the room, classroom, and, and that's uh, what we're continuing to, to work on. Just some quick feedback from our educators. Uh, we've heard nothing but praise from our participants in this. And we're already planning for next summer. Registration's open right now. If you know a classroom teacher in elementary school or in secondary school, because we're expanding these to include high school teachers this year, they can visit our website, alabama200.org, and sign up for these uh, institutes that will be taking place in the summer of 2019. Another great way that we're trying to stress uh, Alabama, good Alabama civic values in the Bicentennial is through our Bicentennial Schools Program. Back in August, Governor Ivey announced the 200 schools that were selected statewide on the basis of proposals that they developed for student-led community projects. So this is community and civic engagement in the classroom where the students develop and lead these projects to identify a need in their community and to undertake work to try to address that need. And we've got schools participating in all 67 counties. Uh, they've just been uh, great to see so far and a lot of good work yet to be done. This is some of Governor Ivey's charge about how to uh, set the expectations for our young people and then give them the support that they need and then expect them to lead in this process and, and to make these projects a success. These are just a few of some of these uh, that are taking place around the state already. I hope that you're on the lookout for these banners when you're driving by a school campus in particular, and this includes both public and private schools. You'll see these bicentennial school banners hanging on the fences and on the walls. All kinds of fantastic projects from doing historic preservation projects in the communities to uh, food, food pantries to community gardens. Uh, just fantastic. Uh, down in Choctaw County, they have where internet access is a serious problem. Their community project was to develop a community computer lab where parents could come in, pay their bills online, and 
apply for jobs and trying to work on a resume, all those things that we take for granted, that they have <coughs> limited or no access to do down in rural Chautauqua. Why, why, do we, why is all this important? Uh, why put these resources toward this effort? Uh, this is a question that came up a lot. We were designing the Museum of Alabama several years ago, which is a fantastic exhibit that opened in 2014. I encourage you all to come up and visit us and, and see that. And a member of our uh, board of trustees at the time gave us the best answer to this question that I've ever heard. Why is it so important to put these resources toward developing a museum and strong history education. And she said, it's really simple. It's because you can't love what you don't know. And if we don't raise children who know the state that they're from, who understand the communities where their families come from, who understand the economics that shape the decisions that are made in our state, they are not going to love it. And when they grow up and find opportunities elsewhere, they're probably not going to stick around to help us build a better path forward. So if we expect to have a different outcome in the future, and to stem that brain drain that has plagued Alabama for too long, we've got to do a better job of helping our students to understand the place they come from. What better way to do that and through those primary sources. And this brings us back to the Vance Shores in the port. And Jack called me back in the spring uh, after a program where Ms. Shores had come to see you all and brought her father's scrapbooks. It's a fantastic, oversized scrapbook. It's massive. It's got uh, something like 229 pages in it. Uh, full of newspaper clippings and letters and photographs that belong to Arthur Shores, her father, and two other bound letter books full of correspondence that had come to him from people both nearby and from halfway around the world. And Jack asked, told me a little bit about meeting Miss Shores and, and how all that came about, and asked if this is something that we would be interested in, and arranged for me to go to her home and pay a visit. Um, and we started flipping through this scrapbook in the room that had been virtually destroyed by a bomb back in 1963. And it was one of those moments where, uh, I, you know, I look at a lot of historical materials and records and collections and everything, and there are some moments where the hair just stands up on the back of your neck and it's just, you have to kind of catch your breath, you know. <laughs> this was one of those moments. This is Arthur and Lucy's application for admission to the University of Alabama. It was one of the first items that I turned to in that travel. And so we stayed and visited the shores and talked for a while about the importance of these records and how powerful they are, both for, as primary sources for historians who write the story of the civil rights movement, the contributions of her father, and so many other people who worked to advance civil rights in our country but also the power that it holds to help create that connection for young people to the history that was made here, not in Philadelphia and Boston and all those other places where really important things happen in the advancement of civil rights in our country. But right here in Alabama and right here in Birmingham, these things happen. And so we talked some more and, and she became interested in uh, sending these materials to the State Archives for preservation there. And the timing of this was uh, ideal because we were in the process of trying to raise money to purchase some new equipment that would allow us to digitize this large format scrapbook because right now we've got <coughs> machines that we can do, you know, tabletop uh, scanning, flatbed scanning and, and scan photographic negatives, but we weren't really equipped to do this large type of material. And it just so happened that we had been raising some money through our friends organization, we had some bicentennial resources that we could put with that privately raised money and were able to purchase the equipment that we needed to be able to scan this material. And all of that was finished last week. And uh, within a few weeks, all of you were going to be able to go online and flip through Arthur Shore's scrapbook and 
can see these amazing materials that some of you got to see here in, in person already. And it, the, the range of material is just amazing. And of course, authoring Lucy's story and the integration of the University of Alabama plays a prominent role. And you can follow that story through the pages of the scrapbook in, in just an amazing way. So it's everything from his letter to the University of Alabama notifying them that he has been retained as Miss Lucy's counsel uh, to uh, subpoena, uh, subpoena and the President Carmichael from the University of Pierre. Uh, lots of newspaper coverage of the response to her admission and registration at the University and of course the terrible violence that broke out there. The progression of this case as she suspended and then the court rules that decision. Uh, and then as you, many of you know, uh, the university's response to that was to expel her on the basis that uh, the federal lawsuit that she had filed actually maligned the University Board of Trustees. And on those grounds, she was completely expelled from, from the university. All this unfolds in these primary sources that this is, a, this is a perfect example of the type of resources that we build lesson plans around. So you, this is where we develop those critical thinking skills in students while they're also learning history. So we talk about well, what is a telegram? How many fourth graders or how many twelfth graders today know what a telegram is or have ever seen one before? Or understand how important they were in a lot of legal uh, maneuverings and political decision making and, and actions uh, back in the mid 20th century and we talk about how do you read this document and how do you understand the, what's being communicated and the decisions that are going on in the background and shape the content of this telegram. A fantastic learning tool and it's concise, it's not terribly long, it's something that you can sit down and read in just a couple of minutes and develop entire lessons around, around it. Again, lots of great uh, photographs. You can follow Mr. Shore's legal career through these clippings. So it was about desegregation uh, in higher education. It was about desegregation in housing and his fight against uh, segregated uh, zoning ordinances. This is going all the way back into the early 40s, 1939. Voter registration. very personal consequences of his courage and of the courage of all the other people involved in this effort. Coverage of the bombs that uh, heavily damaged the Shores home. Put all these in a sequence as part of a teaching unit. This is just a fantastic way to think about, to help to convey to someone, you know, what, what, what does it take to uh, have the courage to keep doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. And understanding the role of the state in opposing the, legis the litigation that was taking place, uh, the importance of the litigation as being one of those critical legs in the Civil Rights Movement, which you know, too often gets overlooked. And, and I've heard Fred Gray talk about this many a times, that the demonstrations in the street were critically <coughs> important. The economic boycotts were very important. But those who provided a framework in which the attorneys were creating a legal strategy to overturn this system of segregation and that existed. And all of those things had to work together in order to make progress. Uh, this is difficult for you to read on the screen, but uh, these letters in Mr. Shore's letter books come from the White House and Congress and people in leadership positions all over the world, but some of the ones that are most uh, impressive and, and, and heartfelt are the ones that come from people from all walks of life, from other parts of the country, that are written to him after their, their home is bombed. But this is from uh, a housewife in, in West Hazleton, Pennsylvania. He's writing to Mr. Shores because she's read about the, the newspaper coverage about the bombings. And she says, uh, Dear Arthur, just a note to tell you our prayers are with you for your safety and that of your family and for courage of these dreadful days. When 
this fight for justice is won as it must be, we are to deserve, to deserve to exist as a democratic nation. The contribution you have made will be the same. So letter after letter like that uh, coming from well-wishers for observing what he's doing. And you can also use this collection to, to talk about change over time. Because suddenly when we move from this position of bombings on Dynamite Hill, just a few years later, Arthur Shores is on the Birmingham City Council. And what makes that dramatic change possible within those few years? All of those contrib contributions that I was talking about a second ago that have to work together to make that possible. And it winds up uh, being you know, probably one of the most uniformly respected men in Birmingham. Uh, and, and such an important leader uh, as Birmingham moves into the 1970s and, and past those years of legal victories and legislative victories uh, related to civil rights. So this has just been scanned, uh, and I'll show you how you can find it on our website in just a second once it's, it's uploaded. It hasn't been uploaded on the public website yet, but it will be soon. Well, I'd like to transition, just give you a quick introduction to some things that you can find in the archives that are maybe helpful to you as attorneys sure that you're that you're aware of and so I'm going to move over here to the computer to do that. Before I do, let me show you that URL, Alabama200.org. We're also all over social media. And the same is true for the Department of Archives and History. You can follow us on social media and uh, visit us on the, on the website. So when you visit our website, uh, we've got a complete rebuild of our website that's uh, underway currently that we hope to have finished in a year or so. Uh, this website looks a little archaic in terms of its design, it, but it has served us and served the public extremely well for a long time. And it is one of the deepest rabbit holes you're going to find anywhere. You can spend as much time as you have to spare on this website. But as you're looking for things that you can access easily from uh, your home, you go to Explore Collections. And we have our digital archives, our materials that uh, started out as paper or photographs or negatives that have been scanned. So these have all been digitized. And have amazing collections of photographs, uh, textual materials of all kinds, and many of these were originally scanned to support our education efforts. But we're continuing to scan and scan just because we can now provide easier and better access to these. One collection I want to point out here is going to continue to grow. In 2016, we acquired the photographic negative collections of the Alabama Media Group. So this is the photo archives the Birmingham News, the Huntsville Times, and the Mobile Press Register. Uh, the earliest images are from the 1920s. It really picks up in the 1940s. and goes up to about 2000 when they stopped using film photography. Uh, we think there are about 6 million images in this collection. We're going to be scanning this for years to come. But you can already do some searches, and we're, we've, we've prioritized two topics that we get the most requests for. Anybody want to guess what the top two are in Alabama? <laughs> football. Football is one. <laughs> Civil rights is the other. So those are the two topics that we've actually done the most scanning on so far. Right now, you can uh, do a search in here, and it's going to lead you to this envelope, which is actually the uh, photo assignment uh, envelope that was created. This was the Spring Hill College in 1979, uh, but it, it points you to, it, it will suggest what's in that envelope, uh, because we haven't been able to scan all the photographs, we're initially doing the envelope, so we have something of an index in which you can get an idea of what's there, and you can submit a reference request if you think that we've got something that's going to be helpful to you. Think about the richness of this, and, and its usefulness as a research tool as you're trying to go back and document this period of Alabama history. But the one that I wanted to show you more specifically, 
someone, Aaron was talking about maps earlier. We've got fantastic historical maps that are online and available to you. Um, we have greatly expanded our digitized legislative acts and legislative journals and the constitutions and all the proceedings of the constitutional conventions. So if you're really wanting to get into the uh, weeds on some of the language of legislation that has passed, everything from 1818 until 1999 is on our website. Past 99, you go to the Secretary of State's website and you can do a search and every piece of enacted legislation uh, is, is there. Uh, we also have the legislative journals like I said, all the proceedings and all the uh, constitutional conventions you can find there as well. A different collection, remember those are all print that have been digitized, but we are now living fully in the electronic age. So we also have an electronic records collection platform <coughs> that uh, right now only has two record sets in it. Some of them are the electronic records from Governor Bob Riley's administration. The other are the house journals that are now created electronically, and we just acquired the Senate journals for the last several years. So if you're really interested in going in and, and understanding legislative intent and the context in which some legislation was being passed, you can come in and do full text searches on these journals now and uh, find some really fantastic information. So I am in uh, these house journals and do a search for bingo because I don't know if you know that's come up a time or two and now we have legislature in these years. But you say bingo. <laughs> that's right. And we can go back to two, 2010, that was a hot topic. And uh, you can do a full text search here. It's going to take you to every instance of bingo in uh, the House Journal. And pretty soon we'll have the Senate Journal. Another tool for you to use is actually our catalog. And pretty intuitive. Uh, I just came in here and I'm going to do a search for Supreme Court. And got uh, a lot of administrative records related to the court, which can be interesting in themselves. And by the way, we're coming up, uh, Alabama's judiciary was not organized. It took, a few months. <laughs> it took a few more months. Then it happened until March of 1820. So the court's bicentennial actually won't be until early uh, 2020. But we have this fantastic collection of Supreme Court case files uh, going back to 1820 and all the way up to the recent past. Up through 1935 or so, there were some really fantastic, uh, everything from exhibits and filings that, that came with these uh, cases that are uh, just terrific research resources if, if you're interested in getting back to moving beyond the reporters uh, and, and getting back to the original materials that you'll find some things that don't show up in the, uh, in the published uh, decisions. Other fantastic resources that we have include all the governor's collections. We're the only state archive in the country that has all of our governors from the territorial period up to the present under one roof. Uh, important policy, uh, developing development records in those governor's papers, lots of correspondence and, and uh, the records that you'll find related to uh, particular issues that, that come up from time to time. I could spend more of that. Uh, best thing I can do is just tell you to, if you ever have a question, to call us. Uh, go to our website, find the phone number for uh, the research room and our fantastic staff will be happy to answer any questions that you have. We'll give you a good idea if you want to come down and do some research, how to prepare for that, and do some work online before you come. It will help make your visit there more productive and uh, they'll be sure to get you pointed in the right direction. So, I hope, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to talk to you about uh, these initiatives that we've undertaken. Uh, we think that, and I, and I hope you got the impression that it is our priority, one of our priorities, is to be sure that uh, 
Alabama's young people today have opportunities to learn about the importance of civic responsibility. And that, that has a direct connection to the work that you do every day. And I think it's vitally important to the overall health of our state and society in which we live. So thank you for the work that you do. And I invite all of you to come visit us uh, just as soon as you have an opportunity.